Uh, my wife and I were uh, just newlyweds when I received a, a phone call one evening that said, uh, congratulations, Mr. Moore. You are the lucky winner of a large screen TV and, and or a new car or a luxury vacation. And I thought, well, this is fantastic. I mean, I really, I thought, I thought, okay, the odds are it's probably the TV. Like that seemed like the most realistic thing. I was like, a new car probably is too much to hope for. And they said, all you have to do is, is come down to our prize center to collect your winnings. And I, I believed them. I, I, I hung up the phone. I told my wife the good news. I, I called the number that they gave me to set up my, my time to come down to the prize center in order to collect this wonderful new TV. I, I made sure that I took the seat out of the, the back of the Jeep and had all that ready to bring home my TV. And I, I went and I showed up and I was there and I said, you know, where do you, where do you, where do I get my TV? And they said, well, why don't you just come in this room here? And, and so there's a room with maybe about 100 chairs in there. And I sat down, and there was a lot of people in there. And I thought, wow, they're giving away a lot of TVs tonight. And I sat down, and they began over the next, like, 45 minutes to explain how I was given this incredible opportunity, once in a lifetime, really, they said, to buy into a timeshare strategy that would change my life forever. And that in this once in a lifetime opportunity that, that if I didn't act in sense, I, I, I would be foolish. Now I was, I was in ministry, a junior high youth pastor. I had just gotten married. I mean, literally like I had no money. So I, I kindly explained to somebody, so there must be a mistake. I, I was awarded a, a large screen TV and they said, yeah, yeah, that's at the end. And so I sat there for a while, I went through, and then we went out into this separate room and they sat you down with somebody and they began to explain everything. I said, listen, man, you're, I have no money. Like, I, 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 I'm just here for a TV. And they talked to me for 30 or 45 minutes about how this would be the biggest mistake of my life if I pass this opportunity up. And, and I said, listen, I, I, I can't do it. And so they brought in this guy's boss, right? Like they bring in the next guy, like the closer or something. Like we've got a really stubborn one here. And, and he goes through the same thing. I'm like, man, I, you're seeing very nice. I don't have any money. Like I would love to talk to you, but this is, I, there's a problem that you don't seem to understand. I am supposed to get a new TV, right? <laughs> And I, and I went into the next room that they move you into, and then it's like the mob boss or whoever this guy is. And he's, I thought we were going to be trapped there, like that we would never get out. And eventually, after a seemingly an infinity of, of saying, like, I can't buy into anything right now, they, they let me go out the door. And there was a lady there with a scratch-off card. And, and you scratched off the card, and of course, I won the luxury vacation that if you went through 97 simple steps to get through, you could go on. It was all a big hoax, designed to sell you something. And, and because I believed that I had won the large screen TV, I acted on it. I, I went and showed up and, and took all the steps. But every time after that, I picked up the phone or I received an email that began with, congratulations, Mr. Moore, I immediately hung up the phone and I immediately deleted the email because I don't believe them. Because I, because I don't have faith that what they say that, that is happening there is, is ultimately happening. And we all know somewhat intuitively, that there is a correlation between what we believe and how we live and how we act. If someone claims, for instance, to have experienced a, a transformative moment in their life, if they're committed to doing things differently, if they say, I'm going to be a, a new person, but we're a little skeptical of that, we say things like, well, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it, right? Right? We're essentially saying, like, you're going to need to prove it. We want their life to validate the transformation, the new them that they say they've experienced. 
And on the flip side of that, that very same expectation, the action that ultimately reveals faith or reveals what we believe, one of the most common criticisms we, we hear as Christians or as the church is, is specifically from our culture, is this perceived or actual claim of hypocrisy. That what we teach, what we say we believe, and how we live and how we act don't, don't match up. Sometimes those accusations are fair. Sometimes they're not. But the point really isn't whether or not there's hypocrisy in the church. The point is that we, we acknowledge that we all operate out of this awareness of the relationship between what we say we believe and how we live our lives. See, today we are going to look at a passage in James's letter to the church, a famous passage really, and, and really in the eyes of some, you would say an infamous passage where James is addressing the relationship between genuine faith and action. And throughout this letter now, James has been unapologetically practical. And so it comes as no surprise that that James is going to be somewhat direct and somewhat emphatic when he wants to teach the church, as he says, that faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. We're going to pick this up midway through the chapter. We'll have it on the screen as well. This is what James writes to the church. He says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother and a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. His faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that said Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. It's important that as we begin to unpack these verses together and what James is saying here, that we, we begin by talking about what James means when he says faith and deeds. This is the first thing that we see here. What James means when he says faith and deeds, several years ago when I was leading a trip to um, Ecuador, I, uh, one of our, our main projects was to lay a concrete foundation for a building that was going up. And so we had teams of people over there. We, we would mix all of the concrete in this giant mixer and, and the students would shovel up the, the gravel and the sand and the cement and, and put it in the mixer. And one of the Ecuadorians was there who would oversee the process and he would kind of look at the concrete in there and then shout some instructions. And, and I was watching this, taking all of this in, and, and he noticed that the concrete was mixed too runny. And so he said something to a group of students or to some of the other Ecuadorians, and, and he used the word sopas, and, and, and they went and they grabbed some gravel and they brought it over and they poured it into the mixer in order to thicken it up. So I, I began to assume that the word for gravel for these little rocks was sopas. And, and it just so happened the next day that they put me in charge of mixing the, the gravel. And so I was watching it, or mixing the, the concrete, and I was grabbing, watching this, and every time I would look, if it was a little runny, I'd say, my sopas, my sopas. 
and they were kind of looking funny, and like I would point, I'm still working on like Spanish, is this there? Yeah, and, uh, and then they would eventually get it, and eventually one of the, the people, the students came over and said, why do you keep saying more soup? <laughs> and see, what had happened was that, that I had heard, he was saying, this is too soupy, and so they went and they got more gravel, and I was like, for, for uh, these stones. See, it's important when we look at a passage like this that we, we take the time to understand what James is talking about here. What does he mean when he talks about things like faith and deeds? Because if you have been around Chapel Street for really any time at all, you have heard myself or one of our other pastors say that we, that at the very heart of our faith, is the belief that salvation is the good gift of a gracious God to us that comes through faith alone. The gospel message is that God's incredible love for us is so great, so fantastic, that he sent his son Jesus, who is also fully God, to enter into this world, to become one of us, to live a perfect, a a, a sinless life, And then take on the the entire penalty of sin for you and me, for, for all of humanity, and to bear it on the cross, to to die on our behalf. And then he overcomes sin and death and hell through the power of the resurrection. And and he's done all of this for us, for you and me. And if that weren't enough. He offers this salvation to us entirely free of charge. We don't, we don't earn it. We don't pay for it. We don't work for it. It is a gift that is given by grace, and we respond in faith in order to receive it. If you remember just a little while ago, we were studying Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and Paul describes it this way in chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. He says, For it is by grace that you have been saved. Through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. This is what we mean when we talk about the gospel. This is at the core of of what it means to be a Christian, and we don't add to it. We add nothing to it. So then how do we reconcile this understanding with what we read here in James? How do we reconcile with what James says here in verse 24? When he says, you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. The ESV says it this way. He says, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. One of the things that I read this week in a commentary is that a better translation here is not by faith that is alone. See, because we know that James can't be teaching us to add works to faith in order to be saved. That would be antithetical to the gospel. That would nullify the work of the cross. We don't earn our salvation and not even a little bit. So so James is not teaching us a works-based salvation. He's not even teaching us a deed-supported salvation. So what is he saying then? What what does he mean when he talks about faith and deeds? You see, James James wants us to understand that faith, genuine saving faith, will inevitably be marked or characterized by action. He's saying genuine saving biblical faith will impact how we live our lives. James isn't teaching us that we'll be perfect He isn't teaching us that we're never going to fail. In fact, he's already talked about this in chapter one, how trials help produce perseverance and we grow in our perseverance. He says, so let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. He recognizes, he acknowledges that we still have growing to do. I I think of it this way in terms of what James isn't teaching us. So if we were to understand, if I put this equation up on the screen, and if you were to think of it as, as A plus B equals C, James is not saying A is, is faith and B is works, and if those two come together, 
that equals salvation. I think rather he is using here an if-then argument. He's presenting this in an if-then strategy. Look at this other equation. He's saying using the same sort of terms here, if A, if faith, then there is C, salvation. And if there is C, that will ultimately produce itself in works, in B. Does that make sense? I think this is what James wants us to understand. He wants us to get the fact that, that placing our faith in Jesus for our salvation is transformative. And so James is telling the church where there is no sign of transformation, then James is questioning the fact of, of have they understood the gospel? Have they really understood what Jesus has done for them? Or have they really placed their faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins? He goes on to, to give us an example of this. Look back in verse 18 and 19. He uses this rhetorical conversation, but someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. See, James here is, is telling the church, look, transformative faith is more than mental assent. It's more than, than understanding and agreeing with information about Jesus. It is possible, according to James, to, to intellectually understand, to be able to answer the question correctly on the test and yet not place your, your trust in Jesus. And he says even the demons do that. And, and he says they shudder. See, J James here wants us to understand that transformative faith is, is more than mental, mental assent, but it's also more than an emotional response. James uses the examples of the demon in order for us to understand that transformative, genuine faith in Jesus Christ is more than what we think about him. And it's more than how we feel about him. Genuine faith in Jesus, the kind of faith that that takes uh, that which is dead and makes it alive again? The, the kind of faith that turns us into new creations? That, that kind of faith will be characterized in our actions and in our obedience. Again, not perfectly. It doesn't mean that we're, we're, we never sin again, but it's not void of that. And Paul, if you think about that passage in Ephesians, Chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, when he's describing this incredible gift that we have. And he says, it's not by works, it's by faith. It's by grace, through faith, that you've been saved. Not by works so that we can't boast. He goes on in verse 10 to say this. He says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So this is what James is talking about when he's talking about faith and deeds, and it's important for us to kind of understand that at the outset of this, because now he's going to go on and he's going to develop the problem of faith without deeds. Faith without deeds. When I was a kid growing up in the back of our yard, um, back by kind of an alley that ran behind our house, my dad had parked his old Saab. That is like a three-cylinder Sob that he had in college and it was his car when my parents were newlyweds and and I think it must have had some nostalgic value to him or something like that but my entire childhood that car sat in the exact same spot and never moved and so for us as kids that's not a car that was like our hill for king of the mountain right that, that was a fort that we used during a snowball fight. That was a spaceship that we pretended to be in when we were being transported to Mars. Because as a, as a car, as a car, it was useless and it was dead. And this is what James wants to teach us about what faith without deeds is. Again, back in chapter 2, verse 15, he's going to give us this very practical example here. He says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. 
But some of you will say, I have faith. Or you have faith. I have deeds. See, look at two things James wants us to understand here about faith without deeds. Or what we might just call lip service faith. First, in, in James' view, it's useless. In fact, he asked the question, what good is it? Keep, keep in mind here that James has been heavily influenced by, by Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. So this, this description in, in Matthew that we have, this sermon that Jesus delivered where he's describing the ushering in of the kingdom of God and, and how it is, he compares it in contrast with what he calls the kingdom of this world, the operating system that we're all living in. He says, we're not doing it like that anymore. I'm ushering in a new kingdom, a new way where the, the last will be first and the first will be last. And, and he describes this in, and he talks about how the fulfillment of this is going to come. So James is living in this early church with this kingdom perspective, and, and he's, he's all about building the kingdom in the here and now. This is why James is so overtly practical and, and action-oriented. He wants the church to be about its kingdom business. And in his view, his understanding, faith without deeds is ineffective. Faith without deeds is is, is useless in that regard. It doesn't build the kingdom, he's saying. Imagine for a moment that, that, that we have decided to repaint this room and that you are solely responsible to accomplish that. And we say, we all provide you what we need. We buy all the paint and then we give you a tiny little uh, artist brush and say, hey, we're going to need you to get this done. Like this, this is James' argument here. It, that doesn't get it done. James is being, again, overtly practical. This doesn't build the kingdom. It's as useless as saying somebody walking in here who's a part of our church and they're, they're half naked and they're, they're starving to death. And, and we're like, hey, good luck with that. Keep warm, be well fed, friend. Like if we haven't met their need. That's useless in their life. And this is how James describes works without deeds. Or excuse me, faith without deeds. But I think what's more concerning here, what's more devastating to James is the fact, uh, rather than the fact that it's useless, is that a faith without deeds is just dead. And I think this is where we really begin to see James' heart for the church here. James understands that it's, it's by faith that we trust God. It's by faith that, that we obey God and that it's with God, in God, that we experience life. That's where life is for us as the believer to be in relationship with him, to, to trust him enough to obey him. This is the very place for, for the Christian that we are most alive. I remember uh, several years ago, um, on again, another one of our mission trips, I had the opportunity to bring my entire family with me. This was in Puerto Rico, and we went to this beach with the students at the end of the trip, and there was this enormous pier that, that went out into the water. And so, of course, all the high school kids are going out there, and they're jumping off and swimming and having a great time. And my youngest, Naomi, at the time was just six years old, and she's watching all these kids do this, and I could just see it in her eyes. She wanted to jump in the water. And so I went, and I, I, I jumped in, and I got down. There was probably a solid 10 to 12 foot for her, which is intimidating. But it was so hot out there. And it was a long walk back from the pier back to the beach to get in the water. And I watched her with her little feet on the edge of the pier trying to muster up the strength. And I'm in the water waiting for her. And I'm like, look, Naomi, look at me. Look at me. Do you trust me? Do you trust that I will catch you? Do you trust that I will keep you safe in the water? Because here in the water, what's waiting for you out here, this is so refreshing. And this is so fun. You're going to enjoy this so much if you can just jump off. Do you trust me? See, this is what James is saying to, to the Christian. Out there where we trust God, we place our faith in him enough to obey him. He said, this is where life is. And it waits for you. And so James says that, that a faith without works is dead. To say it differently, he's saying a faith without works, a faith that is not set into motion, not put into action, 
It's not faith at all. And again, please hear me on this. It doesn't mean that we never mess up. It, it, it doesn't mean that we never struggle with doubt. It doesn't mean that our inability to live a perfect Christian life is a sign that our faith is useless and dead. But, but what it does mean is that a faith that is ultimately void of a trust that leads to obedience isn't really faith. And we have to go back to the heart of the gospel and we go have to go back to that place where we respond and surrender our lives to grace. James in, in verse 26 says, as a body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Lastly, then James wants us to understand how faith is displayed by deeds. Faith is displayed by deeds. Again, verse 20, he says, you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith that is alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different way? direction. So now here in this passage, James is going to help us understand what this looks like. And he gives us two um, practical examples of, of a faith that has been set into motion. The example of Abraham and the example of Rahab. See, th again, the difficulty of this passage, as we've already talked about, is that it, it, at first glance, we can read this and we can, we can make the mistake that James is teaching us a works-based salvation. But I think these examples that he gives us here ultimately help us to capture and understand James' perspective. Because Paul, when he is talking about this, he is looking at, at if you were to think of that equation, that if-then equation, he's looking at it at the side of, of A. And he's saying there's not enough works, there's not enough, there's nothing in us that we can do in order to earn that, that has to come by faith. And faith, when, it, when, when we have faith by grace, then, then there's salvation. And, and, and so he is looking at it from that perspective. James is looking from the other end of that equation backwards. He's looking from the place of, of what it is that, that faith produces and his results. And he's saying, this is evidence of what has proceeded all of this, this work, this activity, this action. He's saying it's faith. See, Abraham and Rahab are examples in the Old Testament that, that faith alone saves you. But now James is helping us to understand that it's, it's not a faith that is alone. It was a faith, a trust in God that enabled them to obey him. How, how do we know that these two had faith in God? James is asking us. We know because Abraham placed his son on, on an altar. We know because the fact that he was the heir of God's promise to Abraham, and yet he would take him up the side of a mountain and, and lay him out in front of God. We know because Rahab, at great personal risk, instead of exposing the Hebrew uh, spies and, and becoming something of a hero in her own community, she trusted what they told them about what Yahweh was doing, that salvation was coming, and she hid them and ultimately helped them to escape. We know they had faith in God, that their, their faith in God to save because we could see it. And Jesus, is, or James, is telling the church that their faith in God should be displayed by what they do. Our, our, our faith should be on display as evidence that I trust God enough to obey him. See, it's not, it's not the action that saves us. But it is the exercise of our faith that demonstrates a transformative trust in the God who saves us. I'll, uh, I'll wrap up with this, but 
I was at a, a conference this week and there was one of the presenters was talking about this gathering that he had been a part of in London and, and there was this Rwandan pastor there. And if you know the story of Rwanda um, in, uh, many years ago, several years ago in the early 90s, they, they experienced this horrible genocide. Um, two tribes went at war against each other. And, and what you may not know is that prior to that, Rwanda was a country that where over 80% of the people in that country identified, self-identified as some sort of Christian, being a part of, of some Christian religion. And so at this conference, one of the, one of the people asked him, how could that happen? How could a, in a place where so many people identify as being Christian, could one million people die at, at their own hands, at the hands of their own countrymen in the course of a hundred days? Like, how could, that ha- how could that happen? And the pastor responded, he said that the gospel that had been preached in Rwanda, it was partial and it was reductionist. Meaning that that, that It was not a gospel that called them to a place of transformation. See, James wants the church to know and to believe and to live the gospel, the full gospel, the transformative gospel, and he wants the truth that we hold in our hearts and in our minds to be on display in our lives. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. Lord, we acknowledge at the outset, from the very beginning, Lord, that we don't live these perfect lives. But God, I pray that as we are reminded here by James of what you came to accomplish, what you've done on our behalf, that we would place our entire faith in you and that this would be a trust that leads us to obedience so that we experience the life that you have for us there. God, put your good work on display in us, your church. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.